Today, Ali and I will be discussing our favorite entertainment that we consumed in 2021. This is Doctor vs. Comedian. I'm Dr. Asif Doja, and this is the Doctor of Laughs. Not a real doctor. For the last time in 2021, Ali Hassan. Every episode, I pick a topic for Ali from comedy to entertainment, and I question him about it. Then usually, Ali picks a topic for medicine and health and grills me on that topic. But today's a bit different. It's our year-end edition of Doctor vs. Comedian. And so today we'll be discussing our favorite movies, television, books, and music we consumed in 2021. That's right. We don't have any medicine and health issue because there was only one burning Mm -hmm. medical health related thing this year. This patch on my inside thigh, this rash that I had. No, people were talking about it. That's all Ali thinks people were talking about this whole year. Uh, I know they were. I heard them behind my back. So, yeah, we figure COVID has been done to death. It's still going on. We have many issues going on. So I think since that was probably the number one topic this year for medicine, we would leave that aside and you can uh, maybe listen to us today and get some ideas for other things to to occupy you over the holidays instead of worrying about the end of the world. Grim, dark, bleak. So Ali and I each thought we'd pick a couple of our favorite things that we consumed over the past year. It doesn't necessarily have to be something that came out in 2021 if if we kind of discovered it for the first time in 2021. We're pretty loosey-goosey with these rules uh, that we decided for ourselves. And we're definitely going to cover, probably in reverse order, TV, movies. And then we talked about discussing music or books, but then a little uh, issue came up with that. Uh, Right, Ali? Well, yeah, I mean, as we discussed in our last episode, when we were talking about, uh, you know, music from 1991, soon after 1991, I stopped listening to new music. So I'm not great in music. And of course, Asif, books, you see, are are a collection of pages bound usually by a cover and then a back and they have words in them. And I know that Asif... Still not, still not following. You read a fair amount for your job, but you don't read a ton of fiction, nonfiction anymore. Yeah, I probably read four books a year if I if I'm lucky, and then sometimes there'll be like collected works of graphic novels. Like I finished Lock and Key this year uh, that collected works, but that that came out several years ago, so I didn't really include that. And of course, I do read for work, but now nobody uses books. We all read PDFs of, of articles, and so. Uh, Yeah, I should read more, you know, but I don't. So I thought it just makes sense. You're more of a reader. I have gotten into some newer music over the past uh, couple of years. So I thought let's, uh, I'll just do my music and you do your books and and sound okay? You do your little music stuff and I'll do my bookie things. You got it, buddy. All right. Why don't you start off with the books for you this past year? Okay, well, here are, uh, you know, one book that I read, I started this year, I host something called Canada Reads on uh, CBC Radio and Television. So there's five books there that I have to read. That's a, a guarantee. But I try to sneak one in before this this competition. But Ali, you, we should probably just mention to our listeners what Canada Reads is prior to, uh, because not all of our listeners live in Canada or listen to, or watch the CBC. So just in brief, it's kind of like a competition every week. You have celebrities, Canadian celebrities, who are championing each a, a, a book that they've kind of read and come to love over the past few months. And then there's a discussion every episode of the of Canada Reads, and then one book gets voted off the island, essentially, right? And then you're left with one book at the end, which is the winner of Canada Reads. And, and that's a huge, huge uh, boost for the author. They're all Canadian authors and a huge boost. Is that is that a good summary of what... what Dude, I, uh, so, I couldn't have said it better myself. Oh, so can I Just host kidding. it next year? Oh. Just kidding. No, I could have said it a thousand times better. But I let you speak, and I just was... It was more, mainly a test to see if you knew what the hell you're talking about. You do. You do. You got it right. It is exactly that. It is a over four days, a competition style. It's it's a literature competition. We call it the battle of the books. Five celebrities champion five books who will be the winner. And as we say every year, all five books are huge winners. They all become bestsellers immediately. Even sometimes from the point when they are long listed in, in early January, they already 
head to um, you know best selling lists and. It's one of my favorite things about this country. It's one of my favorite things to be part of every single year. And, uh, and I love it. This year was no exception. But before Canada Reads starts in earnest, you know, I have basically about two months to read five books. So before that, the month of January, I try to sneak in one, you know, usually connected to a New Year's resolution of some kind. I go, I'm going to read this. So in the fall of uh, 2020, there was a book, How to Pronounce Knife which is a hilarious book by Suvankam Tamavongsa, okay? That had just won the Giller Prize in 2021. So I was like, I've got to read it. But then I realized that I had on my nightstand, which is where all my to-do list of books sit, the 2019 winner, which I still hadn't read, which is Ian Williams' Reproduction. So I got to work on that. I wasn't able to finish it before Canada Reads. My, my quote-unquote work started for Canada Reads, but I finished it this year. So I wanted to give a huge shout-out to this book, Reproduction. It is really a wonderful piece of writing. I am, I think I've told you this before, really, I love work from what is called the developing world or what used to be called the third world. That's what I found on my dad's shelf. My dad was a teacher of what was called third world, third world fiction. That was his, his main focus. And then uh, some of the, you know, Greek classics, the Iliad, the Odyssey, so on, but mainly third world fiction. So that's what I grew up kind of reading when I take something off of his shelf. And, and I always love that. You know, and before I met our, our great buddy, Dave Diona Ryan, Trini boy, Dave, as we call him, even before I met him, you know, I had this connection to the Caribbean through through literature. And so this is a book, you know, it's got characters who have Trinidadian backgrounds. And I, I love the dialogue. I love It's not an easy read, but it is a beautiful read. And I really liked it. And people call it like a, a story told with the savvy of Zadie Smith with uh, Ian Williams' own um, flavor. And it, it, it's really, really a beautiful look at family and a, a look at love. And I definitely recommend it. It's a, it's a, it's a larger book. It'll take some time, but it's, it's a great piece of work. So, uh, and then next year I will have Suvankam's book, um, how to pronounce knife probably, or because I do absolutely plan to read that this year. Then I got two, two authors, both with the same name, two very different. Number one, he was the winner of Canada Reads. I read this book for Canada Reads. So you can say I read it for work, but I loved it. It was, uh, it's called Johnny Appleseed by Joshua Whitehead. The beautiful part of literature is that it introduces me to a completely different world. You're reading something and somebody else's, you know how excited you are when you meet somebody who's cool and you have a good conversation with them. I feel it's that times a hundred sometimes when you read a great book about something you're not familiar with. And this is a world that so many of us would not be familiar with. You know, this, the character, Johnny Appleseed, is a two-spirit queer young person. Uh, he travels from Winnipeg to the reserve, the Pegasus First Nation, where he grew up. He, for, for work, he does, uh, what is it called? He's a cam boy. So he's, you know, does like sexual things on, uh, on camera for people, you know, for, for, for money. I don't know that world. I don't know most of that stuff. I don't know online sex workers. I don't know queer two-spirit um, youth. And man, it was written in the most refreshing and insane tone. Like he, he broke so many norms. He, he, he doesn't write in the way you've you know, probably grown up reading many people, especially people in their 30s and 40s. And it was cool. It was cool and it was refreshing and I, and I loved it. And he won, when he won Canada Reads, I was almost a bubbling mess on, on radio and television. So that was a great book, which I, I definitely recommend for people who really want to um, experience and read something different. Then another Whitehead, not Joshua, Colson Whitehead not indigenous, black man, wrote a book called The Harlem Shuffle. Now, this is weird because another book I wanted to read uh, is called The Nickel Boys. He also wrote The, uh, wrote the Underground Railroad. Both of those are books that I'm I think, thinking of reading. Uh, Nickel Boys is, it won a, a Pulitzer Prize for fiction in, in 2020. I should have really started with that. But what happened is I heard an interview with Colson Whitehead. And I, I challenge you to hear or, or watch an interview with this man and not want to read his books. He's a walking sales pitch for his work and and he was talking about the harlem shuffle and i just loved that world i just i don't know i think i had just seen a bunch of different films and tv shows set in harlem and i was in the mode and i was like i'm gonna read this and it's a 
It's a very, very cool book about a time that I wanted to read about. It's, you know, all these con artists and crooks and hustlers in the 60s in, in, in Harlem in New York. And it's very cool. And in the background are things like uh, race riots and other crazy stories happening. And they take on the background. They're the backdrop against this very cool story about a guy uh, just trying to make it. As a, as a black man in, in 1960s America. And it was a very cool book. And it's, it's like, a, you know, it's a gateway. It's a gateway because you read that and you're like, well, I got to read all the rest of his work. Absolutely. So anything from Colson Whitehead, I would recommend. Unfortunately, the only thing I've read from him so far is the Harlem Shuffle, but I have a good, good feeling about everything else. Now, those are my three that I'll recommend right now. There's two others that I'll recommend that I have not read. Gutter Child by J.L. Richardson. Now, J.L., is somebody I've uh, befriended over the last few years. She is the books columnist for the show Q on CBC Radio. She is an incredibly thorough person in, in, in her book reviewing. And when I found out she wrote a book, I was very, very excited. And the reviews for this book have been incredible. Gutter Child is on my list. I encourage you to look it up. If it's something you would enjoy reading, please do pick up this book. And then Omar al Akkad wrote a book called What Strange Paradise. Now, two reasons I haven't read that yet. First of all, Omar al-Akkad wrote American War, which is one of my favorite books of all time. I heard that What Strange Paradise is absolutely devastating. You gotta be in the mode for it. You gotta, you gotta be in the right frame of mind for something that is gonna, that's gonna rock you, but I will get in that frame of mind for this guy. So I have not read this yet. Omar al-Akkad was, uh, you know, he recently won the Giller Prize in the fall for this book. Uh, he recently became the writer in residence at Queens where I teach a class. My life is getting closer to him. This book is, is just close to my hands and I will definitely read this book. And I, you know, this is also a man who he wrote two, I think in the end, three complete works, three books, and then scrapped them, was unhappy with them. This is the level. Do you know how hard it is to write one book? He scrapped three because that's the level of perfection uh, he demands from himself. Yeah, just a, a phenomenal dude. Very, very funny. Like low-key funny. You don't even know it's coming, but can also write incredibly compelling, devastating pieces of work. And that's what I hear about What Strange Paradise. Read that or read American War and you're, um, you're, you're destined to be uh, incredibly entertained. It's great. And I, I do, I am going to touch on what you said about you have to be in the mood for certain things with some of our later categories. I'm, I'm going to touch on that a bit. You bet. You touch on whatever you like, buddy. Thank you. So, yeah. So I uh, thought I'd, I'd tackle music. As you said, Ali, it's hard to get into new music the older you get. We talked about the reasons why that is from a neurologic basis on our last episode. But I have been into. I have got into a few bands. So one of them is uh, a band called Motion City Soundtrack, and they're from uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, and they broke up several years ago. Uh, so you might be wondering why I'm talking about this guy. Yeah, I was pretty sad. But this is this kind of power pop songs that I really like. One of their albums was produced by Rick Ocasek from The Cars. Everybody loves Rick Ocasek. So he's a great artist, great producer. And so that's kind of the style, this kind of power pop style. And then their lead singer has had three EPs come out this year. I won't recommend all of them just, just to kind of save you guys some time. But the first one that came out is called An Anthropologist on Mars. That is, of course, a reference to Oliver Sacks' book, An Anthropologist on Mars. And he's one of the neurologists who kind of influenced me into becoming a neurologist. So but it's about five songs on the EP, all kind of power pop, really enjoyable. Uh, so I suggest you check out Justin Courtney Pierre. Yeah. Okay, well, let me ask you something. Did you already like this band? And then the lead singer from this band has an EP exactly. with a reference to Oliver exactly. Sacks, exactly. your sort of hero. Are you serious? That's a exactly. randomly so insane coincidence. I'll check okay, out Justin Courtney crazy. Pierre. Really great stuff from that guy. And another artist that I got into, which I never thought I would, and this is kind of like, it came as sort of like some of your books, came out last year, and I only got into it in 2021, and that's Machine Gun Kelly. Now, Machine Gun Kelly is known as a rapper, and it's quite successful with that. And then last year, he came out with uh, Tickets to My Downfall, which is uh, basically another power pop punk kind of album. 
all songs are like two or three minutes, very quick, very catchy, just excellent stuff. It's so easy to listen to, and it's it's a lot of fun. I really liked it, and it takes you back to kind of that we were talking about the other day, like that kind of uh, late '90s, early 2000s kind of power power pop, like the Blink 182 style that kind of became very popular in Green Day for quite a long time. Machine Gun Kelly nowadays is known as the guy who's dating Megan Fox. I think they were on Vanity Fair or something together. But this is some good stuff, so I suggest you check out Machine Gun Kelly. Another guy who uh, came out with an album, even though he passed away a couple years ago, is Juice World. So Juice World is a rapper, and as people kind of got from our episode when we were talking about 1991 albums, Ali's very rap heavy, and I was more alternative music and, and rock music kind of heavy. And so it's been a long time since I've gotten into a rap album, years, years. And Juice World, several years ago, he had two big albums come out, Goodbye and Good Riddance. 2018 Death Race for Love was in 2019. And I don't even remember how I heard about Juice World. I heard a song or something like that. I started just checking it out, his videos on YouTube. And I'm like, this guy's amazing. And by the way, his name is spelled W-R-L-D, just in case you're trying to look it up. But Juice, the commonly known spelling. That's right. That's right. And apparently he, he took his name after Juice, the movie Juice. Remember that movie? Oh, yeah. The sure, movie, sure. You know. So that's apparently where he, he Omar took, Epps, I think. Yeah, 1992, I think. Was it Omar Epps? Yeah. So it was Omar Epps. And Tupac is in that too. Very oh, good. God. I said Omar yeah. Epps before Tupac. Yeah, Very exactly. Movie. Exactly. But Omar Tupac. Epps was the main character as, as far as I re- re- recall. But they were all a bunch of buddies, right? And anyway, so we're digressing. So anyway, he got his name from, from that. The reason why I like Juice World so much is because he ha- he does this kind of rap called emo rap. That's kind of the name of it. And it's a lot of emotion. And really, it's him and his struggles with addiction. And it's obvious he struggled with addiction through all of his albums. Very honest about it. Almost every song is about him consuming some sort of substance and, and the conflict that that causes in him internally. And he expresses that in, in his music. And, of course, as you may or may not know, Juice World died. Related to substance. He, yeah, he overdosed in 2019. He was on a private jet that flew into Chicago's Midway Airport. He had a seizure. And they, he apparently swallowed a bunch of pills before the cops kind of were checking it out. And he seized and, 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 and died. He had oxycodone and codeine in his system, which are two opioids. So pretty sad. You know, he left this big, big legacy. It, it, honestly, like I've never got into a rap album like his, his, uh, first two big albums. And so last year and then again this year, they've, he's released, or I guess his, his estate has released uh, posthumous albums. So this one from, that came out just a couple of weeks ago is called Fighting Demons. You get some guest appearances on it. The Biebs, Justin Bieber's on it. Eminem is on it. Triple Red's on it. Sugar from BTS is on it. So, and there's a HBO produced documentary that came out about uh, Juice World. I haven't seen it yet. It just came out. It's from the same people who. Um, it's from uh, uh, Bill Simmons, who's been producing some uh, music box documentaries. They did the one on Woodstock. Uh, 99. They did the one on uh, Jagged, on uh, Jagged Little Pill and Alanis Morissette. And this is their most recent one. So Juice World, I really suggest everybody give it a try. You know, of course, lots of lyrics, explicit lyrics, drug references throughout. Uh, but really, really an interesting artist who, who died way too soon. So and I know that you said to me offline that your complaint with rap albums is that they usually had one or two great hits and the rest was kind of fluff. That's obviously not the case with his work. No, it's you can like listen to them all the way throughout. through. And, Stone, uh, Cold, Stone Cold Bangers? Stone Cold Classics. Yes, classics. exactly. And I'll just give two more ones just to, so people realize that I'm not out of touch with the popular music of today. <laughs> God uh, forbid. One God is forbid uh, the, the, the song that just got re-released. You know, Taylor Swift has had an argument with regards to the rights to her music. So she's re-recording all of her music, calling them Taylor's version. And All Too Well has been re-released with a 10-minute video. This is the song that uh, allegedly deals with Jake Gyllenhaal, whose name may pop up later on today, and her relationship with him. The video is great. The song is a Stone Cold classic, as we said. Taylor Swift, you know. People can detract her for whatever reason they want. She knows how to write songs that are catchy and amazing. That's a great song. And the other one, a similar vein, is Olivia Rodrigo. I think she's kind of the next Taylor Swift. Listen, 
18 years old, uh, became uh, kind of popular in, on uh, High School Musical, the musical, the series, which was on, on Disney Plus, uh, which is it was kind of an interesting kind of self-referential series, kind of a neat uh, show. But you know, she came out with Driver's License. I'm like, that's an interesting song, whatever. Sounds like a, a one-hit wonder. And then she comes with this album. This album is good. Like my kids play it all the time, but it's a good album. I, I start to finish on a lot of top ten lists. Again, they, she's got all different kinds of music in there: some piano stuff, some power pop stuff. It's great. And so uh, again, I, I second I, that. I second that. For what little I know, good album, lots of variety, and lots of passion that speaks. Uh, it doesn't suggest it's an 18 year old at the helm. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you that much. Exactly. Yeah. So exactly. there you go. That's my music uh, that I got into in 2021. All right. Okay. Let's talk about movies mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. we'll get in the show. So movies, you know, I was trying to keep it to 2021, but there are some things that I watched in 2021 that were a, a, a little bit older, a little dated. So I don't want any of the nerds in our audience our listening audience to be like, that's uh, technically was made in 2019. Mm-hmm. I know that. But I here are the few of the best movies that I watched this year. One was very recently, last week, The Power of the Dog. Oh, you I, saw it. I know very little about Benedict Cumberbatch yeah. outside of Doctor Strange. Yeah. I don't, I wouldn't say I'm a fan of Westerns, mm-hmm. typically. You had told me it's a slow moving film. I probably would have passed. I don't know what it was. I don't know what it was for whatever reason. I see it's ranking number six or seven in Canada. Mm-hmm. I say, let me give it a chance. I'm Most people wife. are saying it's the best movie of the year. Very, very many top 10 lists. So I'm very curious as to what you say. Just in an aside, it's directed by Jane Campion, I believe. Jane Campion, Australian director, New Zealand Kiwi director. Yeah. I'm not the biggest Jane Campion fan. So okay. I'm very curious as to what you're about to say. Man. She makes very interesting directorial choices, which you as a viewer just are left thinking about. I wonder what that means. I wonder the metaphor. So she, she is a, she's not a director who's sort of like everybody else do the work. I'll just sort of like uh, stay under the radar. She makes some bold choices. And I, and I, I don't know. I love them. I love the directorial choices. Cinematography was beautiful. It was shot in New Zealand, but the acting, man, the acting. And the other thing about when I say directorial choices, I mean, there's a lot of silences. But there's there's beauty and there's weight in these silences. Like it's not a fast moving movie, so that it doesn't sound like my thing. I, I like dialogue heavy. If the dialogue's not there, at least give me some action. There's prolonged periods of time with neither, but they're just there's there's weight and there's beauty and uh, Benedict Cumberbatch. I now want to see anything this guy's been in. It's an acting masterclass. It's really something. Kristen Dunst is great, and this other actor who's name I'm blanking on right now, but he's also terrific in everything. I w- watched him in Fargo and he's actually Kristen Dunst's uh, real life partner. And I think they might've met in Fargo. If you've seen Fargo, she kills somebody by accident and then puts that body in the trunk and asks her husband to chop up that body and put it in their freezer. And out of love, he does that for her. You know what dude, I'm talking that's, about? D- d- dude, that's Jesse Plemons. He's like Lemons. super famous. He's been on Friday Night I Lights. Buddy. Uh, I he was Friday he was Night in Lights Jungle a Cruise thing. with uh, The Rock, and uh, which uh, uh, is uh, you will forgive me for not having is seen uh, yeah that's not on my top of the year. But anyway, <laughs> keep going. Anyway, Jesse Plemons, Kristen Dunst, Benedict Cumberbatch do a phenomenal job, especially Benedict Cumberbatch. And I I don't know. I would recommend that. Like I, I'm going to tell you, it's a western and it's slow moving. And yet somebody who on paper, I would not like that, loved it. So that that one comes out. Something very, very different was Wes Anderson's French Dispatch. And I'm trying not to let it. It's one of the few movies I saw in a theater this year. And I'm trying not to let that be a part of it. For me, you know, the world benefits from the Wes Anderson's. I, I just... The choices that this guy makes. And, and then you see all these actors sign on to do this movie because they love his 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 oddness and his bizarre thing. I mean, I don't know if, how many Wes Anderson fans are here, but if you've never seen The Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou and um, what's the the Hotel uh, hotel uh, uh, Budapest and I'm blanking. I'm all of a sudden blanking on what, anything, anything this man has ever done. The Three Dudes in the Train, Owen Wilson is in most of his things. Anyway, I, I love everything Wes Anderson does. And somebody said about the French Dispatch, this is the most Wes Anderson film 
that Wes Anderson has ever Wes Anderson. And I was like, I get it. Oh, you dude, you're, it. you're not selling this to me. I bailed on if Wes Anderson after the life of If you don't Aquatic. like him. Oh, yeah. So have you, you ever looked like up him? the word twee in, in a dictionary? Yes. Did it say Wes Anderson right after not. that? It did uh, because I don't know if I could do it, man. Like I, I just, I find his movies self-indulgent claptrap. That's what I think about his movies. That's hilarious. So I don't know. Maybe not for me. Maybe not for you. Yeah. I mean, if you don't like Wes Anderson, don't go into this. But it was this beautiful, it's this beautiful newspaper. And, and there's these wonderful characters who write passionately about these certain sections of the news, you know, um, arts influenced, especially. And, and I don't know, man, it, I, opposite the pandemic also, it was like a celebration of like art and creativity, not just Wes himself, but in the movie and in the writing and in the storytelling. And yeah, if you don't like Wes Anderson, don't come along. But otherwise, if you do, or if you ever have, there's, there's beauty in this film. And, and I think, you know, I often say this, like, yeah, it's like not every director is the same. Not every actor is not every comedian is the same. And that's that's a good thing. Right. We mm -hmm. need that variety. Course, yeah. And uh, sometimes we don't like what's out there and we have to be like, yeah, well, you know, this is not my thing. This is not for me. But for me, this movie made a um, made quite an impact. Third movie that I really love was Knives Out. That was mm -hmm. great. Uh, wow. This, you know, I don't know if we've disagreed more. Knives Out, of course, came out like you watched it this year, but it, it was watched been out it for a year. while. I did watch uh, it this yeah. year. Really late Boy, I, I love, and that's not true. I don't love everything Ryan Johnson does, but I, I, I like a lot of his stuff and whew, did not like Knives Out. I thought it was, uh, predictable, a bit self indulgent. Yeah, it was self indulgent. <laughs> it was definitely a yeah. self indulgent movie. I know a lot of people are getting upset right now because I know a lot of people love that movie, but I'm just like predictable, self indulgent. I'm like, I didn't even know. I thought it was a, I, it almost had an Ocean's Eleven type vibe where it got a bunch of people getting together, a bunch of famous actors just like, they just, just hanging out here. What's happening? I don't know. So uh, I thought I it, it. it should have been like a TV show. Christopher Plummer would not engage in claptrap, I true. suggest to I, you. I do love Christopher Plummer. He was actually probably the best part. That movie. He's well, so of course good. he was. Yeah, he's it's so good. amazing. But anyway, so so knives out. I'm totally. I, I got two I'm more. Like, yes. uh, the other one is uncut gems, which again, feel free to disagree. But dude, when Adam Sandler does serious stuff, I am just in love with this dude. And uncut gems is a really it's a it's a, one of those unique films. You know, there's a few films like this, like Borat comes to mind. You watch it once, and it is to never be watched again. It's like that, you know, like it's just like I never need to see that again. I enjoyed it, but please don't ever. Uh, there will never be a second viewing, and I am a, a, a notorious second viewer. I felt that way about Uncut Gems. I'll never watch it again. But man, Adam Sandler with what an insane performance! I really love that. And gosh, as I'm talking about it, I'm wondering, am I going to watch it again? My memory's not the greatest. Yeah, I mean, so give, and give me and two just, years and I might watch it again. So you say but this uh, this uh, movie came out two years ago in 2019, but watched I say you, you, you uh, watch it this year. Fair enough. Yeah. And and listen, I love that movie. Uncut Gems is great. And it's by the Safdie brothers who are very good directors. And they came out with Good Time, which was from 2017. And I I think Good Time is actually a better movie. I, it's, it's one of those. I love that movie. And similar to Uncut gems you start watching uncut gems and you really have no idea what's going to happen in that movie no and i love no. that i love it i do too and I, and I suggest you watch good time do not read anything about it and just yeah. start watching it and good time is what so a lot of people are down on uh, robert pattison am i saying his name properly yeah robert pattison Who's going to be um, playing Twilight Batman? Thing. Yeah, he's going to be playing Batman in the new uh, movie. I watched that movie. I'm like, this guy knows how to act. He is in good time. Robert Pattinson in good time. Yeah, okay. so good. And so, totally co-sign with you on Uncut Gems, Safety Brothers, and I'm uh, advanced co-signing on on Pattinson in the uh, in the Batman. I think he's going to be good. Co advanced okay. co-sign. Final movie uh, of this year, and uh, granted, I didn't watch a ton. Did not watch a ton. Uh, Trial of the Chicago Seven. Oh yeah. Again, I mean, look, you can again say like, oh, uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt and Eddie Redmayne and Sasha Baron Cohen. It's a bunch of guys, uh, you know, indulgent, getting together. But dude, it's Aaron Sorkin, first of all. It's very, very precise. It's great. The only, you know, there were a couple of moments where I was like, Sasha Baron Cohen, you should have worked harder on this weird accent of yours. 
don't know what this is. And yet it didn't bother me a bit because the movie was so great and the performances were so good. And especially the story was incredible and very compelling. And it was, it was Sorkin doing Sorkin. And I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed every second of that movie. No, that movie's great. I, I no complaints there. I do love uh, Aaron Sorkin and everybody in that movie. And I'm going to put in good times. Is it good times or good, good time? time? Good time. No, good time. Yeah. I have a document called to watch. Oh, yeah. It's always. Oh, open. my gosh. I have a huge document like this. And this is what I'm talking about. I got licorice pizza on that. I got West Side Story. I got Tick, Tick, Boom, which is on Netflix, which is uh, uh, Lynn Manuel Miranda's new new movie. I want to watch The Last Duel, uh, King Richard. You know, so there's lots of lots of things that are on my list uh, to watch that Juice World documentary I talked about. So there's many things. They're on my to, uh, to watch list. But you may not want to put the couple movies I'm going to mention on your to watch list. Okay. And this okay. is because of what you were saying about you need to be in the mood for certain things. Certain things that, I, and I usually watch these kind of Oscar dramas at this time of year, December, January, February. I try and get caught up on those before the Oscars. So often 2021 movies. Uh, I wouldn't see till the next year in the early part. So I, I am missing quite a few very good movies. But for a lot of this year, like a lot of us, you kind of look for escapism, right? That's why some people say they like listening to our podcast. They just like a, a break from from uh, from stuff. And that's why, again, as we mentioned at the beginning, we don't really talk about COVID on the podcast because people are looking for a break. And so the movies I'm going to recommend are just pure escapist movies. And these and are all I, ones you've seen. These are all these ones you've, I've you've seen. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. And uh, they're just ones that I enjoyed this past year. And I, I've talked about some of them on the show before. But the first ones, two of them are superhero movies. So the first one is The Suicide Squad. This movie was just so much fun. It's directed by James Gunn, who did the first two Guardians of the Galaxy movies for Marvel. This is mm -hmm. a DC co uh, comic. I think I was mentioned in controversy, then came back. Yeah, the controversy was. I don't know if we talked about this before, but it was generated by right wing wing nuts, basically yep. um, trying to get him fired from Disney, and they were successful for a bit, and then Disney came to their senses and rehired him, but not before DC hired him for the Suicide Squad. It's a hilarious movie. It just it's just entertaining, and that's what I was mm. looking for: distraction, entertaining, just. Leave all your worries at home. Go to the movie theater, see this movie. And I think I told you I, I saw it in the theater, one of the few movies I saw in the movie theater. Yeah. Okay. So you got to entertain me here for a second. Suicide Squad. Is this the third one? No, the this original is the second. One. The first one was this Suicide is, Squad, yeah. which has uh, Margot Robbie, Will Smith exactly. in it. And then this is the Suicide Squad. So uh, just like we talked about yes. the Batman, which is coming out in March, this is the Suicide Squad, just to make it kind of confusing. I think this is more in line with the comic. I Again, I, I apologize if we talked about this before. I love the comic uh, when I was uh, into comics when I was a teenager. Suicide Squad was one of my favorites. Again, the premise is to get a bunch of villains. The government kind of gets them on a work release program, but they have to do missions for the uh, for the government, and then they uh, get released. And if they go off script, there's a implantable explosive. There's a implantable explosive in their brain, and then they blow up their head. So it's super violent. It's hilarious. John Cena's in it, playing a character called the Peacemaker, who is so in love with peace he's willing to kill for it which is just a <laughs> hilarious character they're making a spin-off tv show about it and it's coming out soon on hbo oh, that's max great. so it's just that that kind of idea idris elba's in it mm. so not to be watched with the children uh not, to be not if they're not if you don't want them exposed to intense violence and, and uh foul language but uh it's good margaret robbie's in it again just a tons of fun and then another movie which i just think is is uh Bat ish crazy is Venom. Let there be carnage. So mm. this is a sequel to the movie Venom, which came out a couple of years ago. It's directed by Andy Serkis, who you may know did all the stop motion for not stop motion, did all the motion capture, I should say, for <laughs> did all the claymation, <laughs> claymation. Right? But everybody who remembers Ben doing the claymation on Parks and Rec, that's the uh, deep cut reference there. No, this is the motion capture. So he's an expert in motion capture because he was Gollum in Lord of the Rings. He uh, was in the Planet of the Apes remake movies. War of the Planet of the Apes, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. And so they directed him at this because he has this expertise in kind of motion capture and special effects. So he decided to direct this. It's a ton of fun. We've got Tom Hardy in it who is just, you know, the first movie has its flaws. But the funny thing is this the relationship between Venom, who is this 
symbiote who gets internalized into Tom Hardy's character. I can't believe I'm describing this for people, but and then when the symbiote I mean, comes out, he becomes this yeah. anti-hero Venom who like but Venom the problem with Venom is he likes to eat people's brains and things like that, so they're always he's always trying to keep him in check and this relationship it's mm-hmm. like a Laurel and Hardy Abbott and Costello odd couple <laughs> relationship and Tom Hardy voices Venom and his character of Eddie Brock and it is so funny and I, all I wished from the first movie was like just do more Venom and Eddie Brock interaction and get rid of all the other garbage. And that's what they did. And it is so funny. It's just crazy. Some of the stuff that happens in this movie and Tom Hardy's having a lot of fun. They also have like Woody Harrelson, Naomi Harris. These are very good actors. And Michelle Williams is, has a small part in this movie. She was in the first one as well. And just the way she delivers her lines, she's having a ton of fun. It's, it's self-aware in the best kind of way. It's just dumb, stupid fun. If you don't think you will like this movie, it's like – it's the Wes Anderson <laughs> comparison. If I've just described this to you and you don't think you'll like it, please do not see it. You will not like it. But if you were all on the fence, I'm into superhero movies and not part of this, it, I just thought it was a ton of fun. And for the last movie I'll, I'll mention, I'll just mention one uh, <laughs> more highbrow kind of movie. And it was kind of released on uh, Netflix. I haven't heard too many people talking about it. It's The Guilty with uh, Jake Gyllenhaal, the ex-paramour of Taylor Swift. So it's directed by Antoine uh, Fuqua, who we know directed lots of movies, including Training Day, is a great director. And it's based on a Danish film of the same name. And essentially, it takes place in just one setting. And it's a 911 call center operator who is taking a call. And trying to figure out what's going on with with these with these people, he takes some other calls in between. You see, there's also a backstory. He has a family. He's in, involved with something, and you see how he's actually an ex police officer who's doing this kind of like I forget what that's called when a police officer has to do like a desk work because they're under suspicion yeah. of something, right? So, sure. so th- that's what's going on. You got some uh, uh, voices on there, Ethan Hawke. Paul Dano, Peter Sarsgaard are all doing some of the voices of the callers that come in. But it's really, it's one person. It's Jake Gyllenhaal and then the camera's on for most of the movie. This is very similar. It's actually a Tom Hardy movie called Locke where it's just him driving. I think he's driving into London and it's just him on his car calling people on his car phone for the whole movie. That's it. Yeah. And you think, why would I ever want to watch that movie? Because it's it's a master class in acting. So Locke was good with Tom Hardy. And did you, I don't know if you ever saw that, but but this – I haven't. But the same reason you would watch Tom Hanks in Castaway. Cast Away. Yeah, exactly. The yeah. master classes. Yeah, exactly. These are unbelievable yeah. uh, testaments to people's acting. And The Guilty, I heard a, a, an interview on NPR with Jake Gyllenhaal talking about that movie. And I was in immediately. I mean, you just have to see how how deep he goes in this character. And Jake Gyllenhaal, I don't think he gets the credit he deserves for being such a good actor. This is one of his best performances. The other one was from several years ago called Nightcrawler. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen that. Riz Ahmed's in that as well. That is an amazing movie. Uh, this is great. A lot of people are saying, well, basically just a remake of this Danish one. The Danish one is the same thing, so just watch the Danish one, which, I mean, you know, I, I, can, I can see some people saying that, but I just – I'm taking this on its own, and I think it's great. So uh, for my kind of more prestige drama recommendation, it's The Guilty. Oh, I can, you guys can't see this. Ali's typing this into his phone right now. I'm actually typing guilty semicolon nightcrawler. I've also heard Riz Ahmed in an interview talking about nightcrawler. Jake Gyllenhaal was a 45 minute interview, right? So he goes back and also references nightcrawler. Those are both movies that I need to watch. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're amazing. Yeah. Okay. So that's it for, for movies for me for, for this year, my movie recommendations. Okay. My five shows are uh, seven shows. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm going to go six. through them six. quickly. I'm going to go <laughs> yeah. through them quickly, but one of them is one that we reviewed on this show and I, I, I it's it's a highlight of this year and it's Hacks mm-hmm. on uh, on HBO Max. I really like Hacks. Oh, sorry, uh, I have 7 because I forgot to put Hacks in mine. <laughs> there you go. Well, uh, now you don't have to say it. You can just agree with me yes, in this I moment, but Man, that was really like a phenomenal show from a bunch of different perspectives. And and somebody who's like a lover of comedy, I, I, I really liked it. We have a full episode, a full half episode that we devoted to it. Uh, you could feel free to um, tune into that and, and tune in. I don't know. Uh, revisit that episode and, you know, hear us talk more glowingly about the show. Another show which is just phenomenal is Rami. And Rami is great because of A, Rami Youssef. 
getting his own vehicle for his story. He is a Muslim Egyptian that is interwoven in every aspect of this show. He is very funny. Comedy is interwoven. He has gotten, you know, as we talk about Cosign, second season had Mahershala Ali on it. Third season starts filming in January. Uh, my buddy Dave Merhej, close friend of mine, is part of the show. I love this show, irrespective of Dave's involvement. But of course, Dave being involved with it makes me so much more excited. Problem in Canada, we've discussed this, Asif. It's only av- available on Hulu. So nobody asked me how I got it. I don't want to say that out loud, but it was given to me on a DVD by somebody who I, whose name I will not mention, but a little tougher to see. But if you can, get your hands on Randy. Yeah, I, I, I have seen the first two seasons. So season two did come out in 2020, but again, we're talking about things we consumed in, in 2021. So uh, it's it's my great. The, uh, it's, it's such a good show. And there is a huge an arc that goes around through all of season two. It's not worth even spoiling it for you, what, what happens. Mm-hmm. From the beginning to the end. But R- Rami is one of those characters who's his own worst enemy. It's very well done. It's it's great. So yeah, co-sign that one. Le Disposant is something I've talked about on this show many times. It's called Call My Agent in English. It is out of France. Three seasons. So we watched three seasons over two years. We watched it in 2020 and 2021. We watched all the... My wife and I could not get enough of this show. It's, you know, you don't need to know French to know it. You just have to have some level of appreciation for um, art and acting. And it's about this agency and, and all the cast of characters who they represent. And in fact, those people are played by actual French actors, the actual people playing themselves in most cases, but playing like these incredibly flawed version of themselves. So it reminds me of like Larry Sanders, you know, when those people would come in and you'd be like, oh, that's so cool. David Duchovny is on, but you would get like an extremely uh, either shallow or hyper insecure David Duchovny at the height of his incredible, right? You'd you'd see like they're very, you know, they, they would put on these weird characters for themselves. And you see like this selflessness in these actors. They don't care. They don't have any ego. They're just ready to play these characters and have fun and love this show. Again, call my agent in English or Le Disposant. It's three seasons. Yeah, I, I'm certain if you, if you like acting, you like actors, you like that world, you get lost in this. If you like French as well, you'll love it. But you can, of course, watch it in English. Would you say if you like extras that show Ricky Gervais' extras, oh, would you, would you great say example. like a good, so. good kind of correlation? Yeah. Sure, sure, yeah. sure. Never have I ever is another show that I really enjoyed. You know, there's certain things we, you know, for me, it's like I was talking about Sasha Baron Cohen's accent. If the accent falters, but I still like the show, then who cares? I I felt the same thing about Never Have I Ever. There were some low points with a couple of small things. And sometimes you focus on those small things because the other stuff doesn't raise it up. But I, I'm a fan of this show. I'm a fan of the the writing. I'm a fan of the, the characters, you know, as we've talked about the show on, our podcast, and you can go into that as well, revisit that episode. I mean, pretty impressive. It's an untrained actor plucked out of Mississauga and uh, does an incredible convincing job and is surrounded by a great cast. And um, I like the show and I like the show that the, the, the fact that this show exists. Another show that I love the fact that it exists is a show called Sort Of. Spoiler alert, I have a small role on it that has nothing to do with my assessment here. My assessment is the fact that I am Pakistani, and over the last decade, we have slowly seen some sex, uh, some sex. Over the last decade, we have, uh, uh, you know, racialized people, people of color, whatever you want to call us, we have seen some uh, success in seeing diversity on screen. But this is another level. This is phenomenal. This is a Pakistani transgender person played by Bilal Beg. It's Bilal Beg's own story to some degree and they do a phenomenal job it's a transgender pakistani lead of a show right in that I mean, you you have the highest hopes and they deliver and when i say they i'm talking about bill uh, B- B- bilal but i'm talking about the entire team behind the show fab filippo directs it everybody who stars alongside uh bilal really gives it their all and uh, and again it's one of those things if they didn't you can easily ignore it because the show is so great. It's so grounded. It's so real. 
it's such a phenomenal story. I really, really like it. And I was, it was an honor to be part. Where can people see that by the way? Sort of is available on CBC gem. If you're in America, you may have to search a little harder for it. And then the final two, I'm going to limp to lump together. They are both dramas. They are both phenomenal watching. I cannot say enough good things about succession on HBO and uh, about Ozark on Netflix. Uh, next season of Ozark comes out early in 2022 in January. Amazing writing, just acting that at some points in succession, especially you're like, am I watching a documentary? Is this a documentary about an actual family? And again, low key comedy in succession, but the comedy just sings in the background and it's really, really great. And uh, we've talked about this before us. If there's no reason in this world why I should be interested in a show about wealthy billionaires, like uh, white, wealthy white billionaires, this is not my thing. And yet it is so much my thing. I just love it. And uh, Ozark also, the story of Ozark. I thought it was really done after the last season. And I'm like, I'm okay with that. I will come to terms with it. And now we get this bonus uh, final, final season, uh, as Jason Bateman has said. And, you know, it, it's a show where, my wife and I would be like, oh, it's that director. Amazing. Because we know that that director directs in a certain way. And then, oh, this episode is that director. Remember, this episode was directed by that director. And that's how they did that. I mean, it's just what a journey, you know, particularly in a pandemic. You're looking for escape. You're looking for amazing stories. And you're really, you know, you want to go on a journey, an emotional, mental journey away from your your life. Both these shows will take you there. I, I sing their highest praises. And as we mentioned, Ozark season, uh, the last season came out in 2020. But as we're saying, this is what you consumed in 2021. Which five television shows did you? Yeah. Okay, consume? I have more than five. So I have more okay. than five. So don't don't yeah. limit me to five, please. Two uh, co-signing on Never Have I Ever hacks again, and we're going to talk about you know if you want to listen to some of our re-listen to some of our episodes during the holidays. We have an episode on Never Have I Ever. We have an episode on Hacks. And we have an episode on one other show, which Ali has omitted. But I know you love this show, and that's Ted Lasso. Oh, everybody's, my God. Everybody's talking oh about Ted Lasso. God. Listen, listen, guys. I... I was an early adopter of Ted Lasso, season one. I watched it when it first came out uh, uh, Apple TV+. Plus. Love the show. So happy for everyone on that show uh, that it's having the success. Again, I don't think I have to say much too much about it, but if but you're I can't on believe the fence, I forgot it. If I can't believe I forgot it. <laughs> if you're on the fence and you're like, I don't know, it's not my thing, just check it out. Please. Just check it out. Just, just watch it. I got a free – I got a free – I did not get a free laptop. I got a laptop in January of 2021, thereby giving me a year of Apple. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why, so this was a 100% consumed in 2021 and I loved it. But you know what the difference is? I, when I think about the consumption, I think about sitting in front of a television because it was, you know, Apple, it's all on my laptop and it's a little more, I don't know, watching on a small device. Maybe that's what made me forget about it. It wasn't the sort of the same viewing experience, but amazing. Yeah. And everybody, I've tried many times to explain to Ali how you can stream things and cast them to your TV. But listen, I, I only have again. so many hours in a day to you do explain this. To I have me a again. job We well. tried. I we have tried. a job. Okay. So Ted Lasso, and, and you know, there's something else about uh, these shows as well. Again, Ted Lasso, so enjoyable, uh, so positive. And, and that's, uh, and we talked before about Schitt's Creek from a couple of years ago. These are things that kind of uh, stay with me. So again, I like the shows I'm going to talk about, escapism, fun, and I'll talk about one that we haven't talked about in the podcast, but it's a podcast is the premise of the show, which is only murders in the building available on Hulu in the U S in Canada. It's on Disney plus. And this is Steve Martin, Martin short. And of course, Selena Gomez on it. And which just seems like such an unusual pairing. And my kids actually started watching it because of Selena Gomez. And my wife and I want to watch it for Martin short and Steve Martin. It is a great, Show It's basically about these three people who don't know each other, but all live in the same building in New York, very expensive, high end building in New York City. And someone is found murdered in their building. And they they all realize they all love a true crime podcast. Uh, Tina Fey plays a character who's clearly trying to be like um, the uh, host of Serial. And uh, they're kind of making fun of that. And these guys are like, let's start our own true crime podcast trying to figure out who killed this person in our building. And that's why it's called Only Murders in the Building because they're only going to try and solve murders in their building. And each episode is them working on this podcast. So 
it's a lot of fun from that kind of that point of view and it, it's just so much fun it is hilarious but also you want to find out what happens because it's trying to solve a mystery it's a half hour super easy to watch and binge highly recommend this it's it's really great and it just steve martin is the co-creator wrote a lot of the episodes and you know steve martin is i don't know like He's he's a national treasure in the U.S. In terms yeah, of- yeah, yeah. We barely deserve this man. Yeah. Do you know <laughs> that he was selling out arenas in the late 70s? Yeah. Possibly yeah. early 80s. He was the selling biggest out comedian arenas, the first com- on yeah. Earth. Okay. On Earth. And, uh, and people forget that because then he moved into movies. Then he does writing. Of course, he does all his music on the side. He's an accomplished musician. And Martin Short, he's the Canadian treasure. I love Martin Short so much. Can't get enough of Martin And this Short. is such a great character for him. Uh, some pathos in it as well. And, and all the characters. And Selena Gomez is great too. I think she's probably playing herself a little bit. But she, she's very, very talented. So you got to watch this show. A couple more, What We Do in the Shadows. You want a nice kind of mm. hilarious break. What We Do in the Shadows is based on the documentary film, which is Taika Waititi uh, and Jemaine Clement. And then this is the spinoff TV Jemaine. show. Was that? Jemaine. Jemaine. Not Jermaine, as I always called him. Yeah. And so much fun. So, uh, again, my wife and I started watching it this past year, and then the third season came out. So we just finished that as well. It's it's so much fun. I do find that characters talk very quickly. So I do watch it with subtitles because you miss so many of the jokes. It's filmed in a documentary style. It's about these vampires living in, in America. Just tons of fun. And, and – very good special effects for for a half hour comedy on FX. It's it's uh, great. So what we do in the shadows? Shout out to my buddy Chris Sandiford who's in that show. Just finished wrapping this oh, year again. Another season of it. I didn't know that. in That's Australia. For him. Yeah, yeah. And okay, a couple more. So WandaVision, uh, lots of Disney plus kind of Marvel shows that have come out, but and a lot and Loki is on a lot of people's lists, but. I, I prefer WandaVision, I think. Each episode is very self-contained, especially the early ones, which are all looking at a different TV time period. And really, Elizabeth Olsen is uh, so, so good in this show. I've always loved the Olsen twins. I've no, said she, that. Is, she is the other sister of the Olsen twins. She's the talented one. Oh, ah. so mean. Ugh, so harsh. No, but she is – I mean – she it's a really a master class in acting because she has to play a different character from each of the different genres and uh she's great paul bettany's great as well it got lots of surprises in it Catherine hahn who is just you know always good doesn't matter what she's in evan peters who will come up later on one of my other shows he's in it as well so totally fun one of my other shows aren't you at like eight shows right now yeah i doesn't told you matter. i had okay. more and then you reminded me of never have i ever in hack so i gotta put yeah. them on my list but two more invincible which is the uh, cart- a cartoon that's on Amazon okay, Prime know. Video. So uh, it's, it's based on a comic by Robert Kirkman, who created The Walking Dead. I like this show better than The Walking Dead. It's basically like what would happen if uh, Superman and superheroes exist in, in the real world. Uh, it's ultra violent, but it's, it's a ton of fun. I, I was addicted to the show when I was on the spring. So really great. If you like the boys, which is another Amazon show, very similar to that in terms of it kind of skewing superheroes and, and being ultra violent and the voice cast on that. I can't remember if I told you about who's in this cast has Stephen Ewan, Sandra O, oh, JK Simmons, Jillian Jacobs, Walter Goggins, Zachary Quinto, Jason Mansukis. I mean, the list goes on. Mark Hamill's been in it. Clancy Brown's been in it. Zazie Beats is in it. It's it's crazy. This 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 voice cast in it. So tons of fun. Uh, again, if you think you'd like it, watch it. If you think oh, I'm not too sure about that, probably best to skip it. Uber violent is the key. Uber violent, and then probably my number one show of 2021 was Mayor of East Town. Listen, Kate Winslet, you want to talk about National Treasures? She is like so good in this show. We got Gene Smart again from Hacks and this. I mean, both shows are at the same time. Evan Peters won the Emmy, as did Kate, Kate Winslet in it. Evan Peters was great. Uh, Guy Pierce is in it, another one of my favorite actors. Just you want to watch seven episodes, not eight. It was seven, so just the right amount of character development, mystery, uh, suspense. It's it's just so well done. Julianne Nicholson is in it, and you kind of wonder when you're watching it, like, she's kind of a bigger name for a smaller part. Why is that? And you realize quickly why that's it. David Denman is in it. David Denman, he, he's kind of balding and has a beard. You're like, who is this guy? He was Roy, who was Pam's ex-fiance in The Office. 
You remember? Oh yeah, yeah. sure, sure, yeah. sure. Who like well, you know, wants That's to punch great. out uh, Jim and Jim, and yeah. I'm like, this guy's such a good actor. What? It's amazing. So anyway. Mayor of East Town, I think everybody's He's more talking than just about Pam, it. get your things, we gotta that, go. That's right. It, it, so anyway, that's that's probably my best one. So again, not all of these are escapist superhero or, or comedy is filled with comedies like Ted Lasso. Mayor of East Town, very serious, but just just well done and, and so that's it. That's my that's my TV for the year. Well, speaking of self-indulgent claptrap, thank you for all that, Asif. Not your movies, just you talking. We wanted to give you uh, those uh, early in the uh, holiday season because, you know, you might have some time to watch them. I know that I'm actually going to take some of Asif's recommendations and do exactly that. Uh, There will have to be some uh, yelling at the children and just being like, move. Papa wants to watch. It's my time. But yeah, I'm I'm hoping to spend some time getting caught up on some great entertainment. Well, hopefully we've given you some ideas to do the same. We will be taking a break next week. We won't have a, a show. We're going to, what are we going to do? Spend time with family? Ugh. Something like that. No, That's something like that. We, in, we'll, in theory, uh, we'll be we'll, spending we'll, time with the family. Ali will maybe be avoiding his family. I'm not really sure what will be going it's on. Not something clear. Like that. It's not clear. So we'll be back the first week of January. So we'll be off next week. If you want to, I think if you want to check out some old episodes, maybe check out some of our episodes on these shows. Ted Lasso, Hacks, Never Have I Ever. We have all episodes on those if you want to check those out. And then we'll be back. Remember, in the meantime, reach out to us, social media, Dr. V Comedian, Twitter, Instagram. We're on everything. Dr. V Comedian at gmail.com. Let us know what you think of the show. Some ideas for the new year would be great. We already have a couple episodes already lined up for you, and I think you're going to find very interesting we got some very uh, kind of special guests coming up in the next couple months which should be a lot of fun but we want to hear what you guys want to hear about and remember that although i'm a doctor i'm not your doctor medical issues we talk about it for your interest and information only and they're not medical advice please consult your medical professionals for actual medical advice Thanks for listening. Have a great holiday. Happy New Year. Merry Christmas from both of us. Yes, uh, even though we're not Christian, uh, we, we still, still respect it. We love yes. it. And <laughs> safe and healthy above all else in 2022 is what we... So like we said, we won't see you next week. We'll see you week, the week after. Bye. Bye. Bye.